We are fighting a spiritual battle. We do have a great, mighty enemy. There is darkness in this world that we have to battle against. The day of evil does come, but that does not have control over whether or not we are deceived and whether or not we fall away. Those, none of those things have power over us. I'm Pastor Mike from Good Hope Church, and today we're going to be starting a new series that we're calling Suit Up. And it's about putting on the full armor of God from Ephesians chapter 6. You know, this life involves spiritual battles. There's so many things that we go through. And one of the big things that we need to learn how to do is to fight this spiritual battle. Ephesians chapter 6 really helps us with that. So let's get started. Part 1 of Suit Up. One minute blessing. Let's pray. You know... One of the things that the gospel is supposed to take care of in this world is loneliness and isolation. That is something that that God has a plan to eliminate on the planet, and it is the love of the followers of Jesus for one another. We are to love each other, not be isolated, separate people who love Jesus, but people who love one another. And of course, with 2.3 billion Christians on the planet, you can't be best friends with all 2.3 billion. That's completely unrealistic. But each one should have a group that is supportive and living life together uh, with you. That's part of God's plan. And we want to help facilitate that at the church here by doing small groups and and having teams that people can serve together on and get to know people. Uh, Alpha is starting on the 18th, which is just uh, not this coming week, but the week after that. And we've got uh, at least 80 people signed up for that. So that's pretty sweet. We have great opportunities for you to get to know people. Um, But what I want to pray for, of course, I want to pray for Alpha that everything goes well and all that. But let's pray for the body of Christ to have a revival in loving one another. Wouldn't that be something? Because I feel if we we fulfilled the biblical mandate to love one another and we ended isolation and loneliness among the believers, that, man, we'd be showing the world something powerful. And it would be a great place to be. And the churches would be filled because of the love that people have for one another. So... Let's pray for that type of revival and then pray for us here to be able to see some of those connections happen through Alpha and serving teams and and just people getting to know each other. You know, it doesn't have to be a formal thing. Just get to know somebody and then you get uh, that relationship to begin to build. So let's pray. Let's believe God on these lines. So Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. And Lord, we pray together that your people would be able to follow the mandate to love one another. Lord, help us to love our fellow believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, that's going to take everybody because people get missed and and they're in these spots where only one or two or a few people know their situation and can intervene to share love with them, to share your love with them, and, and to just encourage them. So, Lord, help us to be people who don't let others be isolated and alone but who are quick to give mercy, quick to give grace, quick to love each other. Lord, we pray that for all the believers around the world, that we would represent your truth effectively, not by having strife and and division, but by loving one another. And let us each do our part so that all of us can can know that there are people that care. And Father, for the Alpha Course and other small groups, service teams, and just people getting together, Lord, let those connections happen. Let us be able to grab hold of community and not be isolated and alone in this world, but walking according to your truth and loving each other. Lord, let a revival of love break out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, now we get to start our new series. Been anticipating this for a while. We're starting our Suit Up series. We'll be talking about putting on the full armor of God. Very excited about this. So let's pray, and we will get into our new series here today. So Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy scriptures. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you don't leave us down here to just try to figure it out, but you guide us by your Holy Spirit and you guide us by your holy word. 
Father, help us to understand the spiritual battle. Help us to understand how to get equipped to be able to win and to be able to stand in the midst of the difficulties. And Father, of course, each one of us is dealing with different things. We've got different obstacles in our way, different challenges, different trials and struggles. But Lord, you are able to meet each one of us here right now by your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I pray you would do that, that you would meet us here and you would give us just what we need so we can take our next step. So, Father, bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, suit up part one. So, here's what I want you to understand, and if you get this single concept, you'll have gained control of the basic, important uh, piece of this entire series, and that is this. There is a spiritual battle going on, right? There, there is a spiritual battle. It's not just this sanitized little, you know, well, God is good, and, and I'm going along my life, and it's me and God, and that's pretty much it. No, there is all kinds of stuff, spiritual forces going on. There is a spiritual battle. There is a war going on, and you are in that battle whether you know it or not. This is something that happens to you. You don't have to go find it. It comes and finds you. But the believer in Jesus has access to the tools that we need to fight this battle and to win. This is the most important thing of this whole series. So today's sermon, what I'm wanting to do is to define the spiritual battle, help us to understand the significance and the difficulty of this battle. And so we're going to get doom and gloom, you know, that's about two thirds maybe of the sermon. And we're going to be digging deeper and deeper into the difficulties of the spiritual battle, but then it's going to turn and we're going to find out what God has provided for us. So let's look at the spiritual battle, try to get a grip on it and understand it, and then let's understand the power that we have in Christ. So as we start this, let's remember the shallow soil from the parable of the sower. So this is a, a famous parable of Jesus we talked about a few weeks ago, and here's part of the explanation of it, verses 20 and 21 of Matthew chapter 13. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. So the person who hears the word, what word is that? Well, it's the, it's the gospel truth that there is a God in heaven that loves them and that there has been a sacrifice made so that their sins, however great, however terrible they look in their own eyes, that those sins can be forgiven, that they can be set free, that their past no longer defines them, but they can step into new life and walk with God in this life and have everlasting life in the paradise of God. That is the word that they at once receive with joy. And that's a good word, and you should receive that with joy. Amen? Amen. Amen. But then, verse 21, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So these are people that have uh, no root, and then when trouble or persecution comes, they quickly fall away. Why does the trouble or persecution come? What does it say? Because of the word. So they accept this word with joy, which is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then they step into it thinking it's only, you know, sunshine and roses. And then they find out that there's also trouble and persecution that life still includes difficulties and pains and struggles. And they don't know that. They don't understand that. They think it's all going to be good. And so then when the hard things happen, trouble and persecution because of the word, then they fall away. It says quickly fall away. So here's the next question. Does it open you up to the spiritual battle, to the darkness of this world, when you believe in the word, then trouble or persecution comes 
because of the word? Is it dangerous to follow Jesus? Does it open you up to a spiritual battle? Well, there's a spiritual battle when you believe in Jesus because trouble or persecution comes because of the word. But is it dangerous and are you in a spiritual battle even if you don't believe in Jesus? Well, let's go to the hard path. Let's go to Matthew 13, verse 19. It says this, When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, that's the kingdom of God, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So when someone hears the gospel and they refuse to believe it, they push it away, the enemy is involved in that. So just believing and accepting the word of God isn't the thing that opens you up to the spiritual battle, but the spiritual battle is there for each one. The enemy will destroy someone who doesn't believe just as happily as someone who does. So the spiritual battle is there. And you are not safer being farther away from God. The safest place you can be is in the center of God's will for your life. It's like the, uh, the pictures of the Sahara, you know, and the, the great vast plains of Africa where you've got the lions that are, are chasing the, the little... Uh, uh, little animals and what, gazelles and stuff, you know. Uh, the ones in the middle of the herd are safe. But the ones on the outside edges, the ones that are off by themselves, they're the ones that are in danger. And it's the same way with the spiritual battle. We want to be in the center of God's will. So the key, make sure you don't think that, ooh, I don't want to get too close to God. I don't want to start really living for God because then the enemy is going to come after me. Clearly, the enemy comes from people who don't even believe. And here's the key. The key is to understand the spiritual battle and get yourself equipped to be able to fight and win. Then you can be in the center of God's will and you can be protected in the midst of the spiritual battle. So we don't want to distance ourselves from God being afraid of the spiritual battle because it comes to you if you believe or not. But what we need to do is to draw near to God, understand the spiritual battle, and get equipped to fight and win. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's read verses 10 through 20. And then we'll look at a few of the verses individually. Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. What a wonderful section of scripture. When I was a, a, a young new pastor, pastoring in Big Fork, Minnesota, so, you know, go Huskies, uh, Big Fork, great place, and we had our, our little chapel that we were having church in, and we poured a new floor because the floor was just all broken and everything, poured a brand new cement floor, and before we put the carpet down, we painted, you know, with, painted with big letters verses of the Bible and covered the entire floor. And we had this section from Ephesians chapter 6 that went all the way around the perimeter, three circles, and then with the last two verses fanning out underneath the pulpit. 
So I was standing on top of verses 19 and 20 every time I preached. And let's go back to 19. This is what I was standing on. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And I was conscious of standing on those words while preaching the word of God. And I still, even though we don't have those words written down right here, those words are still true. And people are still praying for me, and we're still believing God for something good to come. So, amazing section of scripture. Let's go back to verse 10. We'll look at a few verses at the beginning of this and uh, try to get a, a deeper grasp of what's going on here with the spiritual battle. Verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. What an important verse. It's important to understand what this verse doesn't say. It doesn't say be strong. It doesn't say grit your teeth and make it work. It doesn't say pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It doesn't say you can do it. It says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Here's something you need to understand about the spiritual battle. You, I, none of us can beat the devil. I'm not strong enough to go up against the enemy of my soul. You are not strong enough to go by yourself to the enemy of your soul. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But here's the deal. We need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So the good news is, is I don't have to be strong enough. It doesn't matter who I am. You don't have to be strong enough. It doesn't matter who you are. It matters if you're strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. When we submit to God, resist the devil, and he flees, why does he flee? It's not because we're all fancy. Here's the picture I've always had. When, when, you know, the enemy comes against us and we resist and we say, you leave me alone, you get out of my head, you have no right to mess with me, go. And we, we cast the enemy out, we take our thoughts captive, and the devil flees. How does that work? I always picture me standing there about six inches tall, trying to act all fancy, with a thousand-foot Jesus standing behind me going... You heard them. You better go. You know, because I don't have that power. But if I am in the Lord and in his mighty power, then I can stand strong in the spiritual battle. So you can't go on your own. This isn't your own strength. This is be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Verse 11. Next verse says, put on the full armor of God. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Put on the full armor of God. As we go through this series, we'll be talking about each specific piece of armor. We need to put on the full armor of God. What happens if someone goes into battle and they're missing some of the armor? You know, like they're just in really great shape, no helmet. Where's the enemy going to go? For the head. <laughs> you got everything is great, but all you have is a helmet. Now what's going to happen? Anywhere else. When it comes to the spiritual battle, we need to make sure to shore up our weaknesses. You know, we need to make sure that we have the full armor of God, not a little bit of the armor of God. Not just one little part. But we need the full armor of God in order to take our stand against the devil's schemes. So the devil is a schemer. The devil schemes against us. What are the devil's schemes? I'll give a few biblical examples. First one is Satan will hurt you in order to drive a wedge between you and God. Satan will hurt people. Maybe Satan will hurt someone you love and then whisper in your ear, I can't believe God is treating you like this. You know, he's allowing this to happen. You're going to put up with that? He clearly doesn't care about you. 
And then you'll go, oh, no, God is allowing this to happen. Maybe he doesn't care. And then Satan will say, hey, yeah, so I'll treat you way better than that. But meanwhile, he's the one causing you the harm in the first place. It's a scheme. It's something that he's trying to do to pull you away from God. That's what he did to Job. He hurt the people Job cared about. He destroyed Job's finances. He took away Job's health for one reason, to drive a wedge between Job and God, to get Job to pull away from God. But it didn't succeed. Satan, scheme number two, Satan will tell you half-truths that are kind of in line with what you're thinking and even use scriptures to try to get you just off track enough to miss God's plan for your life. This is what Satan did to Jesus when tempting him in the desert. Oh, you want this authority? I'll give it to you. Do this. Oh, when he's quoting scriptures and he's trying to get Jesus to be deceived and just kind of thrown off by half-truths and even quoting scripture. Now, I think this might be Satan's strongest tactic because if you're going up against the Son of God, aren't you going to bring your best punch, you know? And this is what Satan did to Jesus to tempt him in the desert was to tell him half-truths, kind of lead him a direction he kind of thought he should go, even using scriptures to get him off track. Didn't work. Jesus saw through it. He did not cave. Satan, uh, scheme number three, and of course there's way more than this, but here's three of them. Scheme number three, Satan will get a foothold in your heart and exploit anger or offense or pride to get you to do something evil. He did this with Judas. He did this with Ananias and Sapphira. So with Judas, you want to know why Judas got so offended and was willing to turn his Lord over to the high priest? It was when he saw that very expensive perfume poured on Jesus and he thought, what a waste. And he was offended that that much money would be spent on this preacher. And he, he gave the, the enemy access to his heart. Said, you know, the, the night that he was betrayed, it says Satan entered into him and he went and turned, uh, he betrayed Jesus. Turned him in. Ananias and Sapphira had pride in their hearts. They were seeing people bringing great offerings to the Lord, and they wanted to be part of that, but they wanted to keep some for themselves. And hey, let me tell you, if you sell some property and you just give a portion of it, there's, God loves that. There's nothing wrong with that. But in that particular case in Acts chapter 6, they, uh, 6, right? 5, 6? So in, in the, early in the book of Acts, uh, Ananias and Sapphira... You know, they wanted, to, they wanted to show themselves to be great givers, and they lied to the Holy Spirit, and Satan deceived them. So Satan can exploit a foothold in anger or offense or pride and get you to do something wrong, something evil, throw you off. So we need the full armor of God so that we're not fooled by the devil's schemes. Verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Is our struggle against flesh and blood? No. What does that mean? It means our struggle is not against people. So is our struggle against those goofy politicians? How about the people that follow the wrong politicians? Is our struggle against them? Is our... (laughs) I always get a variety of, of looks and, uh, and things from the, from the group when I, when I talk about this. Uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, is, our, is our struggle against drug dealers and human traffickers? Our struggle 
is for the broken, for the ones who are separated from God, for the ones who are destroying this world because Jesus died on the cross that all could be forgiven of their sins, could be freed from that life of bringing destruction and hurt to this world and be brought into the family of God. Our struggle is for people. For the followers of Christ, absolutely, but also for and over those who are separated from God and living completely contrary to God. That's who we're fighting for. Not against them. Amen? Amen. Hug that truth and hold it close. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What is our struggle against? Rulers and authorities and powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Does that sound scary to you? I don't, this is, this is not pleasant. Principalities and powers and the dark world and the evil forces in the heavenly realms. We're fighting a spiritual battle. There's evil and darkness in this world and there's spiritual evil surrounding it all. And this is what we battle against. So what should we do? Verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God. Are you properly motivated to put on the full armor of God? It's not people with weird ideas. We're fighting against principalities and powers and forces in this dark world and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Well, let's put on the full armor of God. Let's put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, wouldn't it be nice if it said, if the day of evil comes? When the day of evil comes. And it doesn't mean that everybody gets one day of evil. What this means is that we face evil over and over again in this life. There are times of great trials, times of great struggles, times of great hardships, times of great pain in this life. But if we put on the full armor of God, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. The great promise here is that the day of evil will not take you out but you will stand your ground. Your heart will not break and be pushed away from God, but instead, with the full armor of God, ready to go into the spiritual battle and win, we will be able to stand our ground on the day of evil. A few more minutes of the dark stuff. Then we'll get to the turn. You have an enemy. There is an enemy of your soul. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says this. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So, is this unusual? Oh, I'm going through hardships and suffering. Is that unusual? Nope. It was part of the New Testament reality. The believers throughout the world were undergoing the same kind of sufferings. This is normal. This is normal stuff. That's why we need to be equipped for the spiritual battle, because it comes to us. It comes to all of us. We must be ready. Now, Peter's talking about the devil prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. How does Peter know that? Let's go to Luke 22. Some famous verses here. Simon, Simon, which is Peter. A lot of them had multiple names. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. So Jesus is talking to Peter, and he's saying, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. That you is plural. That's why it says all of you. So Satan has asked to sift the disciples. 
to take out the followers of Jesus, probably the 12 apostles. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. That you is singular. Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But Simon, but Peter, I have prayed for you personally, individually. I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus prays for Peter and calls him to strengthen the brothers who Satan is also asked to sift as wheat. So what's... What is all of this? What are the forces at play? We've got Peter, the eager apostle, ready to win the battle. He says to Jesus, if it all fall away, I won't. I'm willing to die with you. He knows that the day is coming. It's going to be tough. And Peter is like, no, I will never deny you. I will die with you. And when the the uh, soldiers come to get Jesus. Peter pulls out a sword and smacks the guy in the head with it, slices off his ear, and he's ready to die in battle for Jesus. But, you know, Jesus is like, nope, let's not be doing that. We're not here to hit people in the head with swords. That's not the gospel message. You know, it's not the good news. He heals the guy's ear, and now Peter's all confused. He doesn't know what to do. He was ready to swing a sword at people but he's just not sure what to do now. And what are the forces at play? Well, you've got Peter, the eager apostle, the eager disciple, but you've also got Satan who's asked to sift him and his friends as wheat, but you've got Jesus who's prayed for Peter. So Peter goes through this time of confusion because he had a plan, the plan didn't work. Now there's, uh, Jesus gets captured and he's not sure what to do and they all kind of run away and Peter isn't sure. He's, he's confused. People are asking him, are you with Jesus? He's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Uh, I'm not with him. And he denies Jesus three times. Then the rooster crows. And in, in uh, Luke, Jesus and Peter make eye contact. And Peter realizes what just happened. He goes out and weeps bitterly. So was this just Peter? Stupid Peter. Should have been more tough. No, the, Satan is involved in that. The prayers of Jesus are involved in that because later on, Peter is restored and he does strengthen his brothers. But there's all these spiritual forces going on besides just Peter's willpower and Peter's desire. There's a whole lot going on. So Peter understands that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour because he was caught up in the middle of that. So not only do you have an enemy of your soul, but there's also false prophets, false teachers. Ah, let's go to Matthew 24, starting in verse 9. This is Jesus talking about the end times. This was 2,000 years ago. I think we must be a lot closer to him now than they were then. See how much of this you recognize. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. So not only will there be outside pressure against the church, the believers in Jesus, but there will be internal strife and division. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. So there will be people coming and teaching false doctrine, teaching things that aren't true, and they're they're going to deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. So instead of people coming to church and feeling like, oh, the presence of God is here and the love for my brothers and sisters in Christ is here, instead they'll be mad about stuff and they'll, there'll be strife and division and there'll be oh, a bunch of hypocrites and the love will grow cold in their hearts. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So all this garbage, but the one who stands firm to the end, the one who makes it to the finish, will be saved. Let's jump to verse 24. 24 and 25 says this, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you 
ahead of time. So we've got false messiahs, false prophets. We've got pressure from the outside, division on the inside. Yuck. Are you ready for the turn? Should we turn this into, into something that empowers us? Let's look at verse 24 of Matthew 24 again. False messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. If possible. What's that doing in there? To deceive, if possible, even the elect. What does that mean? If possible. Here's what it means. We're not going to create some super detailed theology that goes 100 miles in a different direction. But here's what this means. The false messiahs and false prophets are not in control of whether or not the elect are deceived. They are not in control of that. The devil, the false prophets, the false messiahs, the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms are not in control of whether or not you are deceived, whether or not you quickly fall away. They do not have power over that. That's not in their realm. They can't do it. They deceive if possible. But it doesn't have to be possible. In fact, let's go back to uh, 1 Peter 5.8. Let's read that again. 1 Peter 5.8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What's the good news in that? He can't just devour whoever he wants. He has to look for someone. Some people he can't devour. Isn't that good news? And this is good news. So I'm pacing more than I normally do because this is important. We need to grab hold of this because... We are fighting a spiritual battle. We do have a great, mighty enemy. There is darkness in this world that we have to battle against. The day of evil does come, but that does not have control over whether or not we are deceived and whether or not we fall away. Those, none of those things have power over us. Let's go to Romans 8. Romans 8, 35-39. Let's read this. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So can those things separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Can hardship and persecution and the schemes of the devil, can they separate us from the love of God? They do not have that power. But let's go back to Matthew 13, 21 that we read earlier about the shallow soil. Since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Trouble or persecution came and they fell away. Did that separate them from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? They fell away. So which is it? Does trouble or persecution have the power to cause us to fall away or not? Do we do Matthew 13 or do we do Romans 8? Here's the problem. The problem isn't the trouble or persecution. The problem is the root. The problem is the depth in Christ that people have. The problem is whether or not they put on the full armor of God. 
What Jesus is describing here as them having no root is a very quick way of talking about the same concept that the Apostle Paul is talking about with putting on the full armor of God. When you put on the full armor of God, then something completely different happens as we read in Ephesians 6 verse 13. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, the trouble and persecution, the day of evil came to those in the shallow soil, they did not stand their ground. They fell away. But if you put on the full armor of God, then when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. The trouble and persecution, the day of evil comes either way. But whether or not you're rooted in Christ, whether or not you have the full armor of God determines what will happen in your heart. Because the external circumstances, if you are not grounded in Christ, if you don't have the full armor of God, the external circumstances will affect your heart. And you will become discouraged. And your faith will fail. And your trust in God will break. And you will fall away. But if you are strong in the Lord, then when the hardship comes, it is an external hardship, but it's not an internal faith crisis because you are grounded in Christ. I'm going to invite the prayer teams up. We're going to close here in just a little bit. External factors have no power to separate you from the love of Christ. Don't give them that power. They have no power to cause you to question the goodness of God. They have no power to break your faith or break your hope unless you give the hardships and the trials and the persecutions and the difficulties and the confusions and the evil and the principalities, and the false prophets, unless you give them the power to affect your heart, they cannot separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. This is the good news, that when we grab hold of the power of God and the strength of God, it's not that the trial won't come, but the trial will not separate us from Christ. Let's read Romans 8, 35 through 39 again. And then we're going to focus on verse 37 as our closing verse. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So don't let those things separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 37. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Do you believe that? That when trouble, hardship, persecution... evil forces, spiritual darkness comes at you. No. We're more than conquerors when those things come at us. That's why we're doing a whole series. We've got to put on the full armor of God. We've got to get there. But put your faith on this verse. When you... I mean, how many of you are in the middle of the trial right now? Like today is the day of evil. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Put your faith on that. Grab hold of it. Let's 
Let's find out the truths of God so that this can actually be true and not just a cute little idea. Let's become more than conquerors in the midst of our greatest trials, in the midst of our hardest moments, in the midst of the greatest pain. Let's win this battle. We're going to pray. We'll pray for God to really bring us into the fullness of this. And if, if, if you haven't given your life to Christ, if, if that hasn't happened yet, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. So let's pray together, and then I'll invite people up for personal prayer. We've got prayer teams ready to pray with you. But let's pray together first. Heavenly Father, you are so good. You are so good. Lord, you are so good that you have provided armor for us. That we're not victims. That the, the trials, the hardships, the schemes of the devil, the false prophets and false teachers, all this mess cannot separate us from your love unless we let it get a foothold. Unless we're not rooted. Unless we don't have the armor on. So Lord, help us to get deeper ingrained in you. Not standing on our strength and our understanding, but trusting in you. Help us to put on the full armor of God, fully believing that we can be more than conquerors through you who love us. That we would not only get the victory ourselves, but we would be able to pick our enemies up and bring the victory to them. That that in the midst of the great trials. And Lord, for those who are in the middle, right at the peak of the pain right now, give them hope that none of that has power to separate them from you. Show us, Lord, how to be more than conquerors, how to put on the full armor, how to walk in the victory. If you're here and you've not said, yes, Jesus, I'm in, and you need the forgiveness of God and you want to start that life with Christ or you've wandered away from God and you need to come back with every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you, I want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to call you forward, but I just want to pray for you. Go ahead and raise your hand. I want to pray for you. I saw one hand, two hands. Heavenly Father, you are so good for those individuals as they ask for freedom and forgiveness from the past, that you would just flood their hearts with the knowledge that your forgiveness is total and complete, that we don't need to prove anything, we don't need to bring anything to the table except for a willingness to be forgiven and set free. And then, Lord, walk with them. Walk with all of us. Help us to learn your ways and live them out. Help us to stand firm, rooted and grounded in truth with the full armor so that we can take our stand on the day of evil. Lord, help us to be overcomers that get the victory and who are not overcome by evil, but who overcome evil with good. Lord, encourage us, give us strength, and help us to walk true to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So there's part one of our series called Suit Up about the spiritual battle. You know, this is going to be a fairly long series. There's a whole lot to talk about, but I just want to tell you about the one most important thing. The one most important thing with the spiritual battle is aligning yourself with Christ, getting connected with God and holding on to the Lord. So we do that by putting our faith and our hope in God, by asking for forgiveness of sins and inviting God into our life to be our Lord, meaning that we pledge our lives to follow Him as Lord. Once you get aligned with God, 
then God is helping you and you're not on your own. You're not the one that's just trying to fight against all the forces of darkness in this world by yourself. So make sure that you're connected with God and that you walk with God. And then when you go through the trials, the difficulties, and the struggles of life, you can fall to the Lord. You can have Him help you through it. And as we'll learn later in the series, then God can grow us through these difficulties and build us up. So trust the Lord. Grab hold of Him in the dark times and in the good times. God bless you from all of us here at Good Hope.